Hi, my name is Marilyn Whitlock. I teach English for the Excelsior Classes Consortium. Today I'd like to share with you the three stages of grammar proficiency through which you want to move your child from the earliest years through the end of your high school. So let's start by talking about those earliest years and also I'm going to share a screen with you here to show you some information. And also I want to emphasize to you that Learning grammar is definitely a spiraling activity, which is why I have this image on the slide. You want to start with the basics in the early years. This is when memory is paramount. And you want to start with parts of speech. You may say, why parts of speech? Because they're the foundation for all grammar study. And if your student memorizes the basic definitions for the parts of speech, and what questions to ask to determine what part of speech a particular word is, they will be very well prepared then for intermediate and advanced grammar study. So this is the stage that I see as moving roughly from birth to grade five. So let's look at what you want to be memorizing at the, in those ages. Now you'll see uh, on the next two slides, I have listed the parts of speech. And you want to have your student memorize a basic definition, like a noun is a person, place, or thing. And then in the upper elementary grades, I recommend adding that a noun can also name an idea, like freedom or liberty. It's very important to also teach your students what questions a particular part of speech answers, so that when they move on to more challenging concepts like gerund nouns, they'll be able to identify them because they know that nouns answer the question of who or what. Now, before I move through the rest of the parts of speech, I want to encourage you that at these, in these early years, there are many different ways to do this memory work. Your student may respond well to memorizing grammar songs. There are many of those out there on the market. There are also computer games and other types of games to, in, to help your student learn this basic information. If your student is very straightforward, you may wish to use flashcards or a program online like Quizlet that allows you to just rehearse the information. So a lot of it of how you teach this information will depend on how your student best learns. But by the fifth grade, you really want to make sure that they have these definitions very well in mind. Pronoun simply means a word that takes the place of a noun. It also answers who or what. Verbs, I love this simple definition, show action or being. So they answer the question, what does this noun do? Or what is this noun? Now, verbs are some of the most um, important of the parts of speech, and they're some of the most complicated of the parts of speech in English. So there is a little more they need to know than just the basic definition. I would recommend memorizing common helping verbs and also linking verbs. Those linking verbs are verbs, well, we're all familiar probably that forms of the verb to be, like is and are, are linking verbs. But so are a variety of other common linking verbs, like appears, seems, tastes, smells, becomes. All of those can be linking verbs when they link a noun to a subject complement. Adjectives are words that modify nouns or pronouns. You'll often see the definition describe, but that really isn't precisely accurate. And you may not have thought to yourself that an adjective is a limiting word, but it really is. You can take the, the, um, the noun horse, for example, and if you put an adjective in front of it, brown horse, you've now limited the meaning of that noun to one type of horse. So I think a better definition than describing word is a modifying or limiting word because not all adjectives actually describe, but they all modify. It's helpful to learn that they answer the questions how many, what kind, which one, and whose. The next one to have them memorize is adverb. And I find that the questions memorized to identify an adverb are particularly important because for some reason, many students stumble over identifying adverbs. They also modify just like an adjective does, but they modify more different parts of speech. We're primarily familiar with the fact that they modify verbs, but they can also modify adjectives and other adverbs. And they answer these questions, how, where, when, why, and to what extent. Prepositions show relationships. 
And there's no precise set of questions that I ask my students to learn for prepositions, but I do ask them to memorize a list of about 20 common prepositions. Ones that spring easily to mind are of, to, um, things like that. So you can find lists of common prepositions in many places. Uh, and I recommend having your students learn a variety of those. Conjunctions are just words that join. And they can either join individual words or groups of words. I recommend that you have your student learn three different types of conjunctions. The coordinating ones join things that are equal in grammatical value. And we usually use the acronym FANBOY to represent those, make it easy to memorize. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. The subordinating conjunctions are far more numerous. So you, the students are better off in that case, memorizing some of the common subordinating conjunctions, but basically memorizing what they do. They make one clause dependent on another. They cause a clause, which has both a subject and a verb, to be unable to stand alone. So I usually ask my students to, to learn some of the common subordinating conjunctions. Correlative conjunctions are generally pretty easy to spot because they work together in sets and they have two parts. I'm just showing you one example of correlative conjunctions, not only, but also. And I would all recommend that you have your students learn a short list of those. Probably there are four that are pretty commonly used, four pairs. Interjections are another one that students normally spot easily. They're words that show emotion, like wow, oh, ah. Those are pretty easy to spot. So those are the eight parts of speech. Not a lot to learn, and you pretty much have until most of the way through elementary school to help your students be familiar with those. But by the end of elementary school, it's very much to their advantage if they're familiar with the definition and the questions that uh, those parts of speech answer. That moves us to the next stage in grammar progression, and that is let me get my slide, here we go. The middle grades, which for most students are grades six through eight. Now I put the spiral image on here again, just to emphasize that you don't leave behind studying the parts of speech. You just continue adding as you move up to in stages of grammar proficiency. So some things that I would add to your middle grade grammar study are basic sentence pattern identification. The most common sentence pattern in English is subject, action verb, direct object. This is a sentence like, the cat caught a mouse. Then the second one adds an indirect object. It could be, the man gave the cat cheese. And then the, the next one is a subject, an action verb, a direct object, and an object complement. Object complements um, rename or complement the direct object. Like, for example, my mother painted our house blue. And then blue is an object complement that renames or describes the direct object. The next basic pattern looks the same except that the last part of it is a subject complement. And that subject complement could be either in a noun form, a predicate noun, or an adjective form, a predicate adjective. The L here stands for linking verb. So these would be sentences like, the girl is Jill, Jill, if it's a noun. Or you could say, the young man is uh, athletic. And then you would have a predicate adjective as the last, as the subject complement. So it's very helpful if students learn those basic patterns and can identify them. It's also a time to go a little deeper in their understanding of verbs. Verbs are one of the glories of the English language. We can identify very precise shades of time with our verbs in English. So in, uh, you wanna make sure they know the simple tenses. Most of them learn those easily. That's past, present, and future. But then you wanna add on to those the perfect tenses. Those have a helping verb, and they always include the helping verb either have, had, or has. And they show that a language is completed or perfected. Like, I have finished the class. The progressive forms of those tenses are just ones that use an ing verb and a form of to be, and they show action in progress, like I am reading a book. Active and passive voices are forms of the verb based on who's doing the action of the verb. 
if the subject is doing the action, you have an active voice verb. Like, um, my father painted the house. Father is the one painting, the subject. But if I change that a little bit, I could say the house was painted by my father. I have a passive voice verb then. And it's helpful for students to understand those two voices because in writing, they're used in different situations. We also want to add a knowledge of phrases. Many find prepositional phrases fairly straightforward to learn because they've, if they've already learned their prepositions in elementary school, they're pretty easy to spot. A positive phrases just define a noun or pronoun. Gerunds are the ing noun form of a pronoun of a phrase. Participles are any verb form used as an, as an adjective. And infinitives are the to plus a verb form, like to run, to go, to eat. The, all of those can be used in a phrasal form. Um, you want your students to know that a phrase is just a group of words that doesn't have both the subject and predicate. Clauses do have both subjects and predicates, and they can be either independent, standing by themselves, or dependent. So this is the basic information that I aim for my middle school students to have mastered. And that means not only can they define these things, they can spot them in sentences. And that will involve some kind of sentence analysis. It may be um, just identifying and notating on the sentences the various things, or it could be diagramming. But it's good to have a strong uh, feel for these four areas by the time your student enters high school. And then in the upper grades, you want to move into more complex forms of grammar with your student. Because, of course, at this point, definitely grammar and writing are going hand in hand. And you want your student to be able to punctuate his writing correctly and also to vary it by an understanding of the different sentence structures and the different forms he can use to vary. So you move into a more complex study of phrases and clauses. You want your student to know that there aren't only independent and dependent clauses, but that the dependent clauses can be adjective, adverb, or noun clauses. And I just put a few on here to illustrate for you. In the first sentence, we have an adjective clause, that Jeff built. Now we know it's a clause because it has a subject and a predicate. That is a relative pronoun that introduces this dependent clause. And we can see that the entire clause modifies table. It tells us which table, the one that Jack built. So this is an adjective clause. We can also have clauses that function as nouns. And this one, that he finished early, is functioning as the subject of a sentence, so it functions as a noun. We also know that it's a dependent clause. It can't stand by itself as a sentence. I didn't list an adverb clause because so many clauses are adverbial that your students are probably already familiar with those by the time they reach the upper grades. Um, an adverbial clause would be something like, because I ate all the fudge, I felt ill. <laughs> because I ate all the fudge is a dependent adverbial clause that answers the question why. Why do I feel ill? And then you want to, uh, your student will want to learn a little bit more about phrases. All of the five phrases we discussed on the middle school slide can be used in various combinations, and we would look at those. Uh, it's good to know how they can use those combinations in their writing. Students also learn that phrases can be bare. Now, when students are first learning things like infinitive phrases, which are phrases that begin with to plus a verb, that to is an important marker for them. But later on, as they master grammar, they find out, hmm, sometimes the two can be left out. And that's called a bare infinitive phrase. For example, in this sentence, I can write, I'll help you pack. Or you can hear that it would be the same meaning to say, I'll help you to pack. So to pack is actually an infinitive phrase, but the two has been left out. That's called a bare infinitive phrase. Those are the kinds of structures that we want students to recognize after they're already very familiar with finding the basic infinitive phrases that have the two involved. Another kind of phrase that's usually saved to study at the upper levels is the absolute phrase. And this phrase we often study after we've mastered participial phrases. Participial phrases start with a verb form, like furled, but they don't have a noun or pronoun attached. This is an absolute phrase because it starts with a noun, brow, 
and then it has a participle furled. Brow furled, Susan studied the text. So that is a kind of phrase that we want to introduce our older students to. And the last thing under phrases and clauses that's a more um, complex thing that I like my students to be aware of is the elliptical clause. An elliptical clause just has parts of the clause left out, but you can easily infer what the left out word should be. So for example, in this sentence at the bottom, Sam is happier than she. Than she may not look like a clause because it doesn't appear to have a predicate, and clauses always have to have a subject and predicate. But by thinking about this sentence for just a minute, we will realize that there are implied words. Than she is happy. So that's an elliptical clause because the implied words is happy are left out. So again, these are more complex understandings of phrases and clauses that it's good to have our upper grade students become aware of. And at the upper grade level, I also work intensively with students, and I recommend you do as well, to help them avoid common errors in grammar usage. These are things like subject verbs that don't agree in number and pronouns and antecedents that don't agree in number. Very common mistakes, but confusing for readers. Uh, we want to make sure that in their writing, they are able to use consistent verb tense. Another common problem in um, elementary writing is shifting between tenses. Pronoun use is often confused in a variety of ways. So I work with students to make sure their pronoun use is strong. And finally, there are a variety of types of modification errors, like misplaced modifiers, dangling modifiers, that are common in writing, and we want to make sure our students can avoid. And all of these common errors are dependent on already having a strong knowledge of grammar in order to identify and correct them or to avoid them altogether in the first place. So remember, we are spiraling throughout our children's years of learning grammar from those earliest levels of learning parts of speech through these more complex topics, but we never leave the foundational topics behind. So I would consider continue to analyze sentences for parts of speech, parts of sentence, as I work up through phrases and clauses with the older students. So they keep that knowledge constant. Now at this point, I always like to, um, to address the subject of why bother to learn all this grammar? Well, the very two primary reasons to work your students through these stages is that they're punctuating and their writing of good sentences absolutely dependent on their knowledge of grammar. So for example, I have two sentences here. They both have the same clauses. The clauses are in different orders. And being able to spot the clauses and knowing what kind they are determines what punctuation should be in them. Now, I've left out a comma that's needed in one of these sentences. And a person has to know grammar well to see where that comma goes. So, for example, in the first one, we have the intrepid traveler reached the mountain summit. That's an independent clause. Then we have a dependent clause after she had climbed for days. Okay, so in sentence number two, we have the same clauses, but the dependent clause is placed first. After she had climbed for days, the intrepid traveler reached the mountain summit. In order to know which one of these requires a comma, I have to know the rule that when a dependent clause comes last, like it does in number one, we do not put a comma in front of it. But when a dependent clause comes first, like it does in number two, we do place a comma after it. So in this sentence, the missing comma is in number two, right after days. Another reason to bother with grammar study is that students can improve their sentences and vary their writing. And that's an important marker that separates elementary unskilled writers from more advanced um, skilled writers. The unskilled writer will often write in basic sentence patterns like number one, the intrepid traveler reached the mountain summit. That's the very simplest sentence pattern of subject, traveler, reached, predicate, and summit direct object. In sentences two, three, and four, I illustrate how by knowing about various grammatical structures, that basic sentence can be varied. So in number two, I added in a positive phrase, the intrepid traveler, a woman from New Mexico. That isn't a positive phrase right there, and it's actually 
and a positive phrase with a prepositional phrase inside it. So that's one of those combination phrases. But this whole set of phrases um, defines who the traveler is, and that's what an, uh, an a positive phrase does. Adds some variety to the sentence. In number three, I added a participial phrase right at the beginning of the sentence. Determined may look like a verb here, but it's introducing this entire phrase that's acting as a big adjective, modifying traveler. So this is a participial phrase, determined to scale a 14,000 foot peak. And again, this actually is a combination of phrases because to scale a 14,000 foot peak is an infinitive phrase, functioning as the object of the participial phrase. So uh, um, your more advanced students will be able to spot that when they get to the upper levels of grammar analysis and to use it to vary their own sentences. In the final sentence, I added, I kept everything I've done so far in my sentence, but then I also added a dependent adverb clause at the end of the sentence. And you can see it's right here, as the sun approached its zenith. So the as is the subordinating clause that introduces this dependent adverb clause. And then I know that the rest of these words are a clause because I have a subject, son, and a predicate approached. So I will leave you with, I hope, an enhanced knowledge of how to move your students through the, the different stages of grammar proficiency and why it's important to do so. My name again is Marilyn Whitlock. I will be teaching grammar classes for Excelsior classes in particular Word Guru 1 and Word Guru 2, as well as some language arts classes for the middle grades. So if you're interested in any of those classes, please go to the excelsiorclasses.com website and take a look at them and contact me. I hope to hear from you.